Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the 12 o'clock presentation at VCF MW19. And my name is Chris Skeels, and I'm going to be talking to you about how to rescue vintage electronic equipment uh, from e-waste recyclers. And uh, just real quick, the agenda today, uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction of myself, introduce uh, you to uh, what I do in, in some of my hobbies, just to let you know that, you know, I take this uh, vintage stuff very seriously. And then I'm going to introduce you uh, briefly to e-waste. What is it? Uh, what does it, uh, what does it um, uh, ex uh, consist of? And then um, how we deal with it. And then as it relates to you, vintage collectors, um, we're going to... Uh, talk about the reasons uh, typically why you might receive a rejection if you were to go into your local recycler or e-scrap uh, facility. And so we kind of cover some of the typical reasons why the general public isn't always welcomed into those facilities. And then I'll show you what you can do to maybe mitigate some of those. And then lastly, um, or uh, next to last anyway, um, we'll cover some of the business aspects of it. And again, I'll give you some uh, pointers on how to deal with uh, those folks that are making those business decisions, along with some do's and don'ts, things that you will want to do and things you absolutely won't want to do. And lastly, we'll follow it up with some questions. So this is my hello world part. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to, to me. I am the owner of BoardSort.com. It is a mid-sized nationwide e-waste recycling uh, company. And um, a little history about uh, my involvement with computers. My first machine I got in 1983, bought it from Kmart for $100. It was a Timex Sinclair 1000. I upgraded to a 6064 in 1984. I bleed uh, bread box beige. I just want to say that right now. I'm Commodore forever. Um, I got a Vic modem in 1985. That opened my world up to uh, BBSs and eventually, um, you know, everything that comes with that, social media, the internet and everything. Uh, moved into the 16-bit world with my Amiga 500 in 1988 and eventually discovered and stayed with the PC world in 1990. I'm also a programmer. I program in C-sharp, Visual Basic, Microsoft Basic. Uh, I took uh, Pascal and Fortran in high school. That kind of dates me a little bit. Um, I also can program in Java, JavaScript, and of course PHP and HTML. So as you can see by the video that's been rolling along here on the side, I am also a collector uh, and enthusiast. And some of the machines that you see there are my original machines, and some of those other ones um, I have rescued from our e-scrap company. And so that's why I'm here. I'm here to pretty much share some of the insight that I have into this business and how it can uh, help you collect your uh, vintage computers too. So just a brief intro to e-waste. Um, the EPA defines e-waste as used electronics that are nearing the end of their useful lives and they either discarded, donated, or recycled. And so I think that kind of covers almost by proxy a lot of the machines that are here at any one time. I mean, one could argue that they are nearing their useful lives. Um, and many of these machines, including many of the ones that I have in my collection, have been discarded uh, or recycled. And, of course, uh, many of these machines, including some of the ones that I've donated to the uh, charity auction here, the fundraiser, a fabulous fundraiser, also came from e-waste. Now, this is, gonna, this is I think, going to blow your minds. In the United States, each year, we generate 6.9 million tons of e-waste. Now think about that, 6.9 million tons of e-waste each year in the United States alone. You get a little graphic there, I got a picture of the earth, it's piled up with electronics. If it weren't for recyclers, could you imagine what the world would be? We'd be polluted with, with remote controls and cable boxes and all the other things in our lives that we don't really think much about, but we produce millions of them each day. Speaking of millions, or at least hundreds of thousands, Americans discard 416,000 cell phones each day, each day. So uh, my son and I, uh, the other night, I was preparing for my talk here, and we started talking about the cell phones, and we thought, how, how long would it take to fill an Olympic-sized pool just with cell phones that Americans discard each day? And with a little help of AI, I must admit, uh, we determined that it would take approximately two months to fill an Olympic-sized pool. Could you imagine an Olympic-sized pool filled with cell phones? You dive in and you're swimming around blackberries and iPhones. It would be crazy. But that's just in America alone. 
Imagine the entire world, which the World Economic Forum estimates that nearly 82 million tons of e-waste per year, 82 million tons of e-waste per year will be produced globally by 2030. And that is an increase of 100% over 15 years. So just in 2015, we were producing 40 million tons of e-waste globally. That's a lot of e-waste. Now, most e-waste, as I mentioned, is unremarkable. We don't think about it. it are there everyday things? We look around, how much electronics are in this room? Speakers, lights, the, the driver boards, the ballast boards, all the things that go into all the things that we use each day, they all have circuit boards, and somebody has to take care of them because they don't last forever. And if you were to walk into an e-waste facility, you're going to find things like cable boxes, DVRs, office phones, remotes, printers, copiers, microwaves, heaters, radios, TVs, household items, and yes, peripherals and computers. Circuit boards of every persuasion. You're going to have small boards, big boards, expensive boards, cheap boards. The boards that are in your microwave oven, the boards that are in your, your um, small appliance, uh, millions of them and somebody has to take care of those. So each and every board, each and every piece of equipment that comes through a facility like ours, they are sorted, separated, and graded by hand. A person touches each and every single piece of material that comes through our facility. Now we salvage or rescue the items that we can. And I have a little story about that here as soon as I finish the last couple points up about salvage and saving and some of the things that we do with that. Uh, but in the meantime, we sort them out into the various grades and the different categories of items that we have. Some items are put back into circulation, some items are returned back to their original form of their basic metals. And eventually, uh, those metals are generated here in the United States. We don't send any of our material overseas. It's all generated here in the United States. Uh, you're putting in e-scrap in one end and you're coming out primarily with copper, silver, and gold. Now, I mentioned the uh, upgrades, and this is kind of a cool story. So, uh, as I said, if you walk into an e-waste facility, you're not going to see stacks of all tears. There's not a pile of Apple ones that the guy down the street threw away because, you know, who wants them? No, it's going to be all those other things. But occasionally, when you're in business for you know, a couple decades like we have been, you know, 14 years uh, anyway, you have opportunities to run into things, and I would say that maybe... Once a week, maybe you know, several times a month anyway, we run into things. And um, these are the things that you eventually, and I would imagine you're hoping to find. And some recyclers will set these aside because they know. They know what these items are. And most importantly, they have buyers for them. Because what we have to keep in mind is these items are commodities to a recycler. They were purchased for the purpose of reselling them for more money. Now, we all know that a lot of this stuff would generate more income if it were resold as retro computers instead of ground up into gold, silver, and copper. But if the recycler doesn't know that, all they know is what they do. They're recyclers. They buy scrap and they turn it into metal and they get paid and rinse and repeat. So one of our jobs is going to be to educate them. They may not know, or they probably have an idea, but they don't know what it is. They, they couldn't tell um, a Pentium 4 uh, from a, uh, an Apple 2, really. Um, so uh, we as recyclers, we need to be educated on this, and then we also need to find buyers. And I happen to have one that I work closely with, and it's a, really, it's a cool story. This fellow works um, with Hollywood, and they need to oftentimes source vintage computers. Now, one of my pet peeves, being a vintage guy and being a, a, an e-waste guy, um, I watch TV shows, and I know a lot of us have this experience too, where we watch a show and we see them use a computer and it has the completely wrong operating system on it, or the keyboard isn't right. Um, so, you're, so a lot of these guys, they, they want to make the details right. And, so, and I know um, David Murray, the 8-bit guy, he has a, a story about he, how he restored some Tandy equipment for um, a television show. And so it's a lot of fun. And I have a guy that does that. Um, and so these are some of the items here that um, I've sat back. Now, I actually, these, this video here... Um, I took this just before we left. So this is our current inventory of items, which by the way, um, these aren't necessarily exclusive for this fella. Um, these are all items that we pull out that I wanna see go into good hands. And so um, 
I will admit, full disclosure, I have been holding on to a lot of these materials because I knew that I was coming here and I wanted something to show you all. And so uh, if anything in these videos here, uh, if anyone sees anything, they can give me, uh, reach out to me and, and maybe we can make arrangements. But these are some of the things that I sit back that I find over time. And again, this wasn't just one day. This is a collection of days. But these are some of the things that, that you can find. And those are an example of the things that we save. Now, just one last point about the e-waste business. Um, there are a variety of trade organizations and government agencies that represent and regulate the recycling industry. Now, this is kind of important. I'm doing a little foreshadowing here. Government agencies such as the Department of Homeland Security, believe it or not, Environmental Protection, Protection Agency, obviously, even the Federal Trade Commission, they all have a hand in this business. And then the industry also has representation from groups like R2, e-stewards, Rios, and Rima. Now, my company, BoardSort.com, we are a member of Rima, also known as the Recycled Materials Association. And Rima pre pre promotes safe, environmentally responsible, and economically sustainable recycling through advocacy, networking, and education. And that part is important, the education part, because as I said, recyclers can't pull this material if they don't know what it is. So one of the things that I am getting involved with within that organization um, are uh, webinars, because uh, we actually have in-person conferences, we have on-site training, we have webinars to teach the recyclers about the various things, whether it be safety, uh, the, just the newest trends and, and efficient ways of handling material. But we also host webinars, and one of the webinars is going to consist of educating the recyclers on what to save, how to identify the material, and then I also opened up a new challenge that I have kind of found myself uh, facing because I am an advocate for this. As you see, I'm here at the Vintage Computer Fest. I'm talking to you about this. So I've got an interest in maybe figuring out a way that we can start saving more of this stuff. And I've come up with an idea that we need to put together some sort of a do not destroy database. Now, I don't mean, I mean, it should be pretty obvious. If it's retro, save it. I mean, pff, done right? Uh, but it's really not that easy. And I'll just give you an, an example of the, one of the, the, where this, the genesis of this idea came from. I'm watching the 8-bit guy maybe two, three years ago, and they're, they're in the infant stages of putting together the Commander X-16, and they were having some, some challenges with the sound chip. And it, for a brief moment, the idea came about that maybe they would start using salvaged Yamaha chips. And I'm thinking, yeah, wow, you know, I, I, I have access to this stuff all the time, but, you know, how could I or how could anyone else? And it just kind of started to ring a bell with me. I'm like, man, wouldn't it be great if there was a place that I could go to and say, look, I've got all this material here and I know what it's worth from scrap. But right now, my only resource is to go to eBay. I got to go to eBay and I type in Yamaha sound chip in the in the eBay and look for some completed sales and, and maybe hope that somebody bought one and say, like, wow, it should be saved. It's worth $15. But probably not going to find a Yamaha, used Yamaha IC chip, sound chip on eBay, particularly, you know, a sold one. So, so it opens up some problems. So that's something that I think we as a community want to, we, we might want to start thinking about that. You know, what can we do to share this knowledge that we collectively hold, but anyone outside of this convention has no idea what we're talking about. And there are a lot of people that put their hands on this material that, that maybe should know. So that's a, a thought that we can expand upon uh, in, in the future. How can we start saving this stuff and educate recyclers on it? Now, typical reasons for rejection. So you're going to go to the, to the scrapyard, the recycler, the e-waste facility, and you're going to walk in and then what? One of the reasons um, I came up with the, uh, the idea of, of speaking to you today is because on social media and whatnot, of course, I'm promoting what I do. And I, one of my things that I enjoy is whenever I make an interesting, what I call e-waste save, I belong to several groups. Uh, I take pictures of electronic parts as one of them. Uh, Vintage Computer Club is another. And I like to kind of go on there and post what I've pulled out of the e-waste stream. And I guarantee you probably three or four of the very first comments that I'm going to receive are, man, I wish my e-waste facility let me go in. Last time I went to my scrapyard, they kicked me out. You know, this place says they don't sell stuff. And if you think about that, I mean, this place is buying things. They sell stuff. But they sell stuff to other businesses. They sell stuff because it's easy to deal business to business instead of having some guy come in. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. 
But let's actually speak first about the regulatory uh, reasons, and this is where some of that foreshadowing comes in. R2 and E stewards have very strict guidelines on how to handle certain materials. And they do that with respect to not only the environmental impact that it might have, but also data security reasons. Now, we would like to think that most of the material that comes into a e-waste facility is uh, grandpa and grandma cleaned out their basement and they had that old computer they got from their kids back in the 80s. They never used and now I don't know what to do with it. But the reality is many, if not most of the computers and electronic equipment that you're going to find at an e-waste facility comes from more of a professional environment, doctor's offices, banks places that carry information about people and things that they may not want to have released. And the person with, with all those computers, it, it might be a secretary, it might be a, a, who knows who the person is, but who they're not, they're not an IT guy. They're not someone that can look at 150 um, I3 uh, PCs and say, yep, I know how to wipe those and make them all sterile enough to where any data, data that's on there um, won't be released to the public. So they hire a company, a certified company, who follows the policies and procedures of that R2 and E standard, uh, e, uh, e stewards sets forth to protect and make sure not only is that data going to be protected through um, when you walk into one of these facilities, they literally have all the computers locked up behind a fence and sometimes barbed wire. It's that serious. And they can be fined many, many, many thousands of dollars if they don't do that. So right away, we see a problem. I want to walk into this facility and I'm like, hey, you've got some computers here, man, I'm really looking for. I mean, I know it's not retro i3, but well, frankly, most of the computers that you're going to find nowadays that are being recycled are i-series computers. And they're 10 years, 15 years old now. But that's what they are. And you're going to walk in, you're going to see them all locked up behind a cage, and they're going to be like, oh, sorry, you, know, you, you can't touch that. So that right away is a really tall hurdle to get over, but you can. One of the other hurdles that you're going to find is the fact that a scrapyard, recycling center, whatever, is a very dangerous place, extremely dangerous. Um, We've got forklifts running around. We've got semi-trucks coming and going. There are Gaylord boxes, which if you can imagine, if you went and bought a brand new washer or dryer, the box that it comes in is about the size of what we in the business, or the shipping business even, call a Gaylord box. And you can actually stack those. And you can fit 800, 1,000 pounds of waste into one of those boxes and you can stack them up rather high and so there are those stacks in the building you got forks looks running around very dangerous place in fact some places are so dangerous you have to wear a hard hat so anywhere that you got to put a hard hat on just to walk around probably isn't going to be the type of place that's going to invite the public into and i also spoke to the lack or abundance of knowledge the lack of knowledge obvious i have no idea it's like, do you have all these you know, vintage computers? No, all we have is scrap, sorry. We're not a computer store. Or if you know what you have, you're probably not necessarily going to have some guy come around and look for it because, well, I've already pulled it. And I give you a pretty, perfect example. If you were to walk into my facility, unless you beat me to it, you're probably not going to find a lot of stuff. Why? Because I've already pulled it. And here's the, here's the thing that most people don't realize. Um, I know a lot of different e-waste companies. Being in the business, I talk to my fellow recyclers all the time, and I will tell you that 75% of them have an eBay department. In fact, you can find this out yourself. Go to eBay sometime, do a basic search, and look at the seller and kind of take a look at what they do and where they got the material, and I think you're going to find that they're probably a recycler. That's where a lot of the material on eBay comes from. And so the, a lot of these places already have it. So they may just throw you off the scent. You know, they don't want you coming around because, you know, you're encroaching upon their territory. They're making a lot of money on that stuff. Right. So lack of knowledge or an abundance of knowledge. And then the fact that <clears throat> we're dealing with business to business. Right. I love dealing with business. Business is easy. You, you, you put aside all the social stuff you put. It's just business. Right. No retail sales. So there's no questions. There's no support. The guy's not going to call me tomorrow. Hey, Chris, I, I bought this, this computer off you, man. And it's not working. I plug it in, black screen. What do I do? Can I get my money back? None of that. We don't have to worry about that. No returns, no problems, right? And this is a big one, too. And this is, the big, and this is probably the easiest to overcome, right? And that is squirrels. 
a scrapyard is a busy place. I'm a busy guy. I got a lot going on. I, this, the machine broke down over here. This customer over here has got a problem. I got a truck coming in. I got a truck going out. And here comes this fella, nice enough guy, best intentions, right? But he wants to walk around and, you know, poke and prod and, and get in my way and, and ask this and, and that. And, and finally, he, he finds a, a power supply to a machine that he's been looking for. And now I got to stop what we're going to do. We're going to figure out what is it is. $5, right? Um, we're not a store. And, and I don't mean this about me personally or specifically our company. I'm speaking purely from a recycler. They're not a computer store. And finally... Um, we're actually not allowed to sell, and here's why: uh, we're not vendors. We don't have a vendor's license. We don't have. We don't pay sales tax. So I gotta ring you up, and I do this, and I'll do that. And it's easy enough to get a vendor's license, and it's easy enough to charge a sales tax. Our accountant would hate it, but that's not the business that we're in. We're not a store. We're a recycler. We buy. We don't sell. But that can be changed because it is all business, right? And I have a little secret that I'm going to share with you. You know, the meme, that little ad you always see on Facebook over in the corner. I got one weird trick, right? Well, here's that one weird trick. If you can't beat them, emulate them, right? So they want to do business with businesses. Okay, what is a business? What's, what, what is a business? Becoming or emulating a business can be an effective way to mitigate or manage rejection. As I mentioned, business to business sales are typically exempt from sales tax or vendor's license, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, we can ease concerns of the downstream reporting for, certifi for certification requirements. Now, downstream reporting, remember I talked about R2 and e-stewards and they wanna make sure stuff doesn't end up in the creek down the road? That is called downstream reporting. If I get rid of something and I'm a certified recycler, I have to report back to the, the people that represent me within that certification organization where I send it off to. And if it is not an end user, they also will have to report where that went. In fact, the entire downstream of that material that you drop off at a certified recycler, because again, the guy that had all that data from that office, that's important to him. So the downstream is tracked all the way down to where it gets turned into silver, gold, and copper, except if it's handed off to an end user. Because I'm going to sell it to you, and guess what? Satisfy, satisfies the regulation requirements because I have now put that material back into service. It's not going to end up in the landfill, at least not yet, until somebody else gets a hold of it and hopefully saves it from that fate. Um, and the, the, we're hoping that, you know, obviously the data has already been taken care of because as per the certification, before it was released for resale, someone that is certified in information technology has wiped it and made it clean, and it's good to go. So... Being a business can actually mitigate that. Plus, you are not doing retail business, business to business. So it, it kind of fits. So that, that's, that's a little bit of a help, but it goes even further. A professional presentation can install confidence and it builds interest. So again, got all these things going on, the forklift, the truck, the delivery, the customer, and the nice guy who has all well intentions, but I might not be all that interested right now, you know? But if he's professional, if it's like, you know, he's not just some guy looking around. It's like, it, it, it seems like another business. And, and I might not deal with him right now. But if he has a simple business card, that can go a long way. A simple business card. Because guess what? With a business card, you're now a business, right? When's the last time you've dealt with a business and said, I need to see some credentials here. I want to see your tax forms, uh, how many employees you have, and I'd like, to, I'd like to see the 1099s to go with that. No. If you've got a business card, you're a business, right? And we're talking about just buying stuff. We're not dealing with big corporations and lines of credit and leases. We're just wanting to get in here and convince this guy that, no, I'm not just Joe Collector. I actually have a purpose, and, and I have a method. And a price list can go even further. Right? So I'm going to walk in. Hey, my name's Chris. I'm looking for some e-waste. What do you got? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. Right? A price list. But even further, a price list tells them what they can expect. You know what? It's like, wow, this guy's ready to pay me whatever for this item. Man, I'm, I'm getting half that. I'm getting a fraction of that. Right? And he's right here. Now, again, I might not be in a position to deal with you right now. I might not even have that material right now. 
I might have strapped it all. I might have turned it into that bar of gold that's sitting over there. We don't know. But I'll tell you what, if I know that I can get two, three times the value of that material by selling it to you, the next time I might get it, you know, the next time I get it, I might set it aside for you because I know that I have a buyer. He's professional. He's made everything look interesting to me. So I might go with it find the right person so you're gonna walk into this place and you see some guy he's working at the scale he's putting stuff on there he's weighing it up he's writing it down that's got to be the guy i mean this is what he does right that's not the guy that's not the guy you want to talk to that guy probably has no i know no idea what's going on right he's he knows his material but he he's not a seller he's a buyer his his job is to take the stuff from you weigh it up make sure it is what it is generate a list and you're going to go off and collect your check somewhere, and he's going to go on to the next guy. And so you're going to ask him, oh, hey, by the way, um, while you're weighing it up, you happen to sell stuff? <laughs> no, nah, man, I, I just weigh stuff up, right? So you want to talk to the guy that's going to do that. And I'll tell you who that guy is. It's going to be the owner. And if you can get to the owner, and you can have a real conversation with the owner, you're in, right? Because you need to build a relationship. And a way to do that, by the way, if you ever thought about this, is perhaps be a customer. What a great way to get involved with these guys. Now you've got a reason to be there. You're not just hanging around, getting in their way, right? You're a customer. You're, you're, you're selling them material. You're talking. You're interacting. What a great opportunity to say, hey, by the way, right? I keep getting more of this and this and that. And, and the guy says, well, hey, have you ever thought of this? It's just, it's one of those things. Relationship building. And that really is the key to a lot of this. It's just getting in there, getting to know people. The first time you walk in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like, oh, man, that, that didn't go all that well. You know, but... I left my business card and, well, he took my price list. That's all you need. Now, I'm not going to guarantee you success. In fact, I'm a salesman. That's what I do. I said, I don't, I don't sell, I buy. But I still need to get into the same scrap yards that you guys are trying to get into, right? Except I'm trying to buy in bulk. I'm buying everything that they have. But I have the same challenge and I'm faced with the same goals that I'm sharing with you. And as I'm trying to get into these recycling centers and I'm trying to educate them because they're buying, they're buying tin cans, they're buying aluminum cans, copper pipe. You know, the guy on the street, he went around and collected some stuff up and he's going to come in tomorrow morning and sell it. And I have to go there and convince that buyer that you know, he needs to sell it to me, right? So it's kind of the same thing. So I'm kind of talking to you from experience in that, in that respect. This is probably the one you didn't see coming right? This has netted me more of my vintage equipment than any buying that I've done. This is, this is actually mind-blowing stuff. Free recycling drop-off, right? People will actually give you this stuff. In fact, I could tell you that people will pay you to take it if you really play your cards right, but let's just stick with the free recycling drop-off. If you can get with someone that can provide you a reliable, consistent space, right? And you promote the fact that you'll accept certain electronic equipment. You can judge what that might be. Certain electronic, electronic items for recycling at no charge. If you build it, they will come, I promise you. Because what are they going to do with it? A lot of communities, you can't throw this out. Now, we all know, obviously, you're not going to be able to toss a CRT monitor into your trash can, right? Um, but you, a lot of people don't think that you can throw a computer into there either or any of these are stereo equipment, or you go out there to the showroom and take a look at all the things that are on display, you're not gonna find any of that stuff in the trash, but there are a lot of people. In fact, you'll, you'll be shocked to know. The majority of the people that own this equipment have no idea, right? We're, we are a very select, very rare group of folks that have taken this appreciation to a level that we're willing to all get together in Chicago for, to celebrate this, but to most people, this is junk. This is trash. And it's amazing that there can be that, that diversity of value, but it's true. And so they will give it to you. In fact, you are doing them a favor. God, it's mind blowing, right? Reach out to your local government, right? They, there are the governments, they love to be able to do this stuff. And believe it or not, um, there could be public money to help you with that. Counties and townships, they have recycling drives all the time. The problem that they have is staffing because they don't have either anybody that knows how to do it or is willing to do it or they don't have the funds to pay someone to do it. So if you could maybe step up and you can organize a recycling drive for you, your community. Now, that doesn't mean just putting out the words, hey, everybody show up and bring me all your junk because guess what? 
you're going to have another problem on your hands. What do you do with it? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take all the good stuff, right? So you got that. And you, when you do that enough times, you're, gonna, you're actually going to collect some good stuff, but you need to do something with the other stuff. So you want to partner with another recycler, a local scrap somewhere. You got to figure out what to do with the stuff that you don't want. But that's a great way of, of, of receiving materials for free even. In fact, so at our facility, the location that we're at has actually been a recycling facility for over 25 years. And in that period of time, we have marketed in our local uh, newspapers. We get this community guide that comes out. It's mailed to everybody. Like 500,000 copies are mailed out every year. And in the back of it, there's little community services. And one of the community services listed there is recycling. Electronics drop-off. Free electronics drop-off with our address. And if you show up at our address 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there is a place for you to leave your IBM 5150. And I came in on a Monday morning and sitting right there. Can you believe that? Merry Christmas, all right? So work, well, work with computer companies. You get a computer shop. I know we all know computer shops, right? We've got that computer shop that, that we like the guy. He's, you know, he's a trustworthy guy. Ask him, say, hey, man, you know? Um, if I if I start talking to folks about maybe recycling or material and they need a place, could I have them drop it off at your place? I mean, think about it. These people are getting rid of a computer. They might need a new one. Who knows? But if you can get with somebody to provide you with a, a consistent, reliable, trustworthy place that people can know that they can leave their materials there, and if you have a way to then dispose of the materials responsibly while still cherry-picking the stuff that you want, great way to source it and and as i mentioned local computer stores community centers are a great place to host a um a recycling drive and believe it or not this is the one that you wouldn't see this coming right senior centers who knew senior centers and guess what we have a we we've got a we've got a joke at our facility um my wife works with me and we share an office and i have a lot of security cameras, as you can imagine, we've got a lot going on. And one of the security cameras is on our free drop-off spot. And I have something that I enjoy seeing, and that is old man scrap. And I call it old man scrap, because I watch this fellow, he's, you know, 60, 70 years old, and he's walking up, and he's got this box, and he sits down on our dock, and he drives away, and it's like, it's like Christmas morning for me, I'm gonna run out there, and what do I got, you know? Usually the older folks have the better stuff, right? So it's a little, little, little something. Do's and don'ts. So you're going to walk into the place and you're going to want to pull your stuff out. And it's like, man, here's some of the things you do and you do not want to do. As I mentioned, don't walk in cold and ask workers to shop around. The workers are going to tell you no, more than likely. And there could be unrelated reasons why that person says that we don't sell. First of all, the person might be running cover for the guy that actually does. Remember, they might have an eBay company, and it's like, if anybody comes in here, just tell them, no, we don't sell, because I do, right? Or maybe that employee actually believes that nobody is allowed to buy anything because he's not. Because many e-waste or recycling facilities in general have a policy that if you work there, you can't buy there. And I could go into a long, reason, a long list of reasons why, but if you go up to the, the first person you see that works there and you ask them, hey, can I buy stuff here? They, they very well may tell you no, and that very well may be the right answer for them. <clears throat> Don't overcomplicate it, right? So let's not turn this into, you know, this and that and stuff and, and, and confuse the guy. Keep it simple. Keep the pres presentation simple and easy to follow. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I'll pay for it. And start small. Don't throw every single thing. If you got, here's a list of all the different things. The guy's going to look, I can't, I don't know what to do with this, right? A couple small things, a couple things that you know, more than likely the guy is going to have, right? Establish a successful transaction. Show them how easy it was for you to come in and pick up the stuff that they have, make it a quick, easy transaction, no strings, walk out, keep them happy and come back later. And each time you might find that it gets more and more, right? Don't change things up. Set a price, stick to it. Even if it was the wrong price, oh man, I, 
you know, I'm overpaying a little bit for this. Well, you know what? He's probably not going to have a bunch of them. So overpay for the, in this one. And then next time, maybe do a little better job on picking your price. But don't change it around. Don't let the guy think that you're going to give him $50 for something and you show up. It's like, oh, you know, I really can only do 40 You will never get another item again, right? And be reliable. Be reliable. And this is really something that's most important because we run into this a lot. And not just with the retro computing, because I'm involved in a lot of other types of, you know, hustles, if you will, with folks. And that is a lot of people like to buy scrap off of us. People like to come in. They have reasons they want to buy our scrap, not for vintage purposes, but for other reasons. And so they'll convince us to set it aside. I'm going to buy all this stuff for them. I've got hundreds of dollars invested in this material, knowing that this guy is going to show up next Tuesday and buy it off of me. And guess what? He doesn't show up. And if that happens to you enough times, you know what you're going to start doing? The next guy that comes in and asks, hey, will you set this aside for me? I'll give you more money than what you're getting. I'm sorry, I don't do that. The last three guys that did that never showed back up. And it took me that much longer to recoup my investment. Because again, these are commodities. We're buying it for the sole purpose of reselling it, getting that money, getting some profit, rinse and repeat. And when it's sitting over there waiting for John to show up, and John kind of blew me off because he wasn't really serious. Remember, interest, professionalism goes a long way. Convince me that you're coming back to pick the material up that I paid money for and I took the time and trained my staff to go out of their way to hold back for you. Don't stand me up. Come back and pick it up. And use common sense. Don't, you, you can't just walk in and, you know, look around and be like, oh, wow. I mean, you got to be smart. you got to think about it. It's a strategy. This is business. And business requires strategy because these are seasoned operators. And let me tell you, someone who's been in the scrap business long enough, it is a dirty business. People are always trying to get over on you. It is scrap and they scrap you for it. When you're buying aluminum cans, there's rocks in them. When you're buying copper pipe, there's concrete in it. When you're buying computers by the pound, they, there's a brick inside the tower, right? <laughs> Happens all the time, right? And so seasoned operators, we, we know that things aren't always as rosy and as nice as it seems. So keep it clean and you'll find yourself uh, with success in this, right? And so that is pretty much what I have to offer you. And I am willing to take any questions if anybody has any. Uh, come up and line up behind me if you have questions. And actually, I'd like to start off with one question of my own. Sure. Um, is there any scenario ever where a vintage computer that is received by an e-waste recycler could retain its hard drive? I see them shredded all the time due to, you know, uh, privacy concerns and other, you know, uh, rules and regulations that you mentioned. But these old hard drives are part of the value of the vintage system. Is there any scenario where they can be preserved? Uh, yes. Yes, there is. So um, again, it, it comes into at least, I'm going to speak outside of the certified aspect of it because um, we are not part of R2 or eStewards. As I mentioned, we belong to a trade organization. And so we don't necessarily need to abide by some of those more strict things. Um, but yes, there are certain, certainly scenarios, and, and I, I named one, and that is I come in on a Monday morning and there is an IBM uh, sitting there. Now, uh, that particular machine, which actually, if you had a keen eye, you would have caught, um, that actually had a hard card installed, which probably doesn't work, although uh, Adrian of Adrian's Digital Basement did show us a technique of doing some percussive maintenance on that, and so can't wait to try that out and see if I can get that hard drive to spin up. But absolutely, um, when you get outside of the um, certified recyclers, uh, the chances of having an in intact hard drive are, are good. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, those R2 recyclers, they're dealing with primarily with business, office, medical. Um, you're probably not going to find the, the Quantum or the Bigfoot or the Seagate in there. So, yes, that scenario does certainly exist. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, so, um, since you're in the e-waste business, I'm curious as to uh, how you deal with uh, materials other than precious metals. Like, what about FR4 and circuit boards, uh, plastics and glass and all that other stuff? Sure. Rubber. Great question. And as I mentioned, that if you were to consider 
taking some of the strategies that I mentioned, particularly with the free drop-off, that is a challenge that you're going to be faced with. And so some of the materials that we can't readily recycle, um, the plastics, the glass, we pay to dispose of. So just like anyone else, we have a company that comes and takes those materials from us, and they belong to their own industry that knows how to properly handle those, and that comes at our expense. And then, of course, the circuit boards and whatnot, and the, and the process is, is very simple, really. It's the, once the circuit boards are graded and separated into the various um, metaled values, um, they're ultimately shredded, incinerated, and then um, melted into their uh, prospective metals. In fact, believe it or not, it's all made into one metal, and then ultimately it's being separated out chemically on a larger scale. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that we, we, as I mentioned, we touch every single piece and it is all sorted out into materials that we can process and materials that we have to pay other companies to properly handle. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so being very, very new to all of this, I'm curious, you know, let's say I'm offering a certain price for beige boxes, right? And they are about 30 to 40 pounds each. Um, what's actually reasonable to offer? I mean, how much are recyclers getting for that metal versus me offering three times more, if you will? Is there a kind of a rough price range? Sure. So now are we talking about uh, PC towers? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, typically... Um, we'll sell a PC tower for $10. And a $10 PC tower would have a motherboard, RAM, CPU, and hard drive. What those are doesn't matter. It's pretty much a flat rate. Um, and where that number comes from is you can expect to receive, and I know this This is something I'd, I I try to stay away from this, the sausage making, if you will. We all like sausage. Maybe some of us do, some of us don't. Um, you know, I, I've never visited a sausage plant. I've been warned not to because I want to still enjoy breakfast, right? And so um, a lot of these materials are are recycled, and, and so we do, it's, it's, it's one of those deals where you just try to stay on top of it and the things that you can save and the things that um, can't be saved will be recycled and, and turned into uh, scrap. And so where the $10 value for that PC tower comes from is the value of the insides of that computer ultimately comes out on average to be about $15. So that is the average scrap value of a modern, mind you, modern PC. You go out there and grab any of the uh, Core 2 Duo PC boxes out there when you factor in the value of all the metals and scraps and the circuit boards, you're at about $15. So a recycler would rather sell it for $10 and then they don't have to pay the labor and the processing costs of tearing that down just to get an extra five bucks. Turn an entire pallet around for $500 versus investing a hundred and having to go through all of that. So yeah, about 10 bucks would be a good price to offer to start at. So I've got a couple of questions, if mm -hmm. I may. Sure. The first one is, where do you find these facilities? Because if I just put into Google recycling centers near me, I'm going to get the drop off. I'm not going to get the scrapyard. I'm not going to get these big facilities that get all the interesting things. So how would I go about finding these facilities? Well, e-scrap facilities, at least ones that specialize specifically in e-waste like mine does, there's only a handful of them. Ones that specifically specialize in that. But don't let that, don't let that distract you because that's not where you should be focusing on, and I'll tell you why. Because if we're specializing in e in e waste, there's a good chance we're already doing a lot of what you're wanting to do. So instead, where you want to visit is that scrapyard. So instead, think about this: I've got a trunk full of aluminum cans and some copper pipe. Where can I sell that? And I'll bet you, over the last couple, however long, someone has also went to that very same facility with some computers. See, I got some computers that I want to sell, and I heard that there's a value to them. Now, there's a good chance that since they're maybe a Ferris scrapyard, they're not going to have the pricing structure that we do, and so um, you may not get as good of a, uh, an offer for your e-waste as you would at an e-waste facility, but I would focus more on scrapyards. And the second question I've got is, I can't tell you the amount of times I've had it happen where I've been looking on eBay for 
whatever, come across some weird, unusual, it's a CPU card, could be a RAM card, whatever, I click through, it's a recycler, and there's the CPU in one listing, there's the RAM in the next listing, there's the controller for something in the next listing, all in all, there's maybe seven or eight listings, but there's no backplane, there's no chassis, there's no all these other important bits that you can't get hold of because it's probably one of a kind, and you know damn well the backplane's been recycled already, and the, the chassis's been recycled already, mm. and there's just these cards. Yes. What can one do about that? Is there any advice for how to prevent that happening, or how to somehow recover these items if they've not gone off already and been recycled, that sort of thing? Because sometimes these are genuinely one-of-a-kind systems. Sure. Um, probably what happened is it slipped through the cracks. So I, I can only imagine that if you already have the cards, that tells me that somebody at least knew enough to know that they had a value to them. The backplane, however, backplanes look like backplanes, you know? And so it, it probably may have not stood out enough for someone to recognize that, hey, you know, this is a Motorola bus and maybe I need to set that aside versus this is just a riser card for some XT PC, you know, so I can put an additional uh, serial card in it. So um, my, my suggestion would be then, in that case, take what you can and hope that later the missing per piece shows up. Hi. Okay. So, um, so you recycle all your stuff in the United States. You don't like send it to like some like foreign country like China or something where it ends up in a landfill there? No. Um, and the reason, reason being is the shipping would be outrageous. So th that doesn't mean that people, places don't do that. Um, those places typically aren't profit focused as a private company like mine would be. Um, also, we don't deal with the types of materials that typically would go overseas. Um, for instance, one of the most common overseas uh, export items are CRT monitors because they're extremely difficult to deal with and process here in the United States. Um, we don't accept CRT monitors. So that's the one item that you won't find all that many of at least um, at our facility. And the ones that we do unfortunately have to, because we're in the business, so we are ultimately gonna end up with them. Uh, we have to pay to have them recycled and disposed of. Okay. Is, also, is this show being recorded or is it just, because I see a couple cameras. I'm, I'm sorry? Is this show being recorded? Yes. Okay. Yep, sure is. Yes, sir. All times are recorded and will be on the BCFMW website uh, two weeks after the show. Uh, so my question is, uh, most of the stuff that you've touched on so far has just been like computers, you know, maybe like electronics, like TVs, game systems, stuff like that. But uh, is there like a... Um, a part of this that would be for medical equipment, stuff like MRI machines, x-rays, uh, EKGs, stuff like that. Like um, there can be. We don't necessarily focus on that. Um, I think there's probably a lot of regulatory things with medical equipment, um, but we do deal with a lot of the circuit boards from that. Um, one thing about medical equipment, they turn it over a lot. Um, there are always new machines coming and going, and of course they need to do something with the older machines. And as I said, um, when it comes to medical equipment, I'm certain that there are certain certifications that need to be met with that. And so it probably is easier for them to scrap it than to try to have it refurbed and certified and re redone. Um, but yeah, I, I can tell you this, any, any industry, um, specific item that has a potential for reuse or resale, someone out there is specializing in it. I can assure you that. Cool. My question is about what you mentioned earlier about the idea of a database or something like that, where yes. I'm assuming for recyclers to be able to view things. Yes. Um, is that something that has gotten off the ground at all? And it, w whether or not it has, is that something that I or other people could offer uh, help or resources to support? Absolutely. Yep. Talk, reach out to me uh, after we're done here. I'll give you a business card. It's got my email address and say, hey, Chris, I, you know, I was one of the uh, persons with a question about the, the do not destroy database. Let's talk and, and we'll go. So I have, this is really the first time that I've shared this idea with anyone just this weekend. It's something that I've thought about um, and I've come up with some challenges that we'll have to figure out as far as how to deal with it and sort it and, and propagate it. But yeah, look forward to talking to you about it. Yep, reach out to me and I'll give you my business card. Because I'm a business. <laughs> so 
this may be a little bit overarching and uh, very approximate. If I were to like ground roots the whole thing, there's no, there's, there's a scrapper that I might be able to park, partner with, don't know yet, just starting the research from the beginning and starting out the process of having somebody, you know, having people come and drop off their e-waste with me. About how much time do you think, like man hours would it be to just set up even the first drop off and everything else that's involved? Well, let's assume that you've already have the location. So okay. you've got a buddy who has a spot uh, that's accessible outside that they can leave the stuff or inside really for that matter. Um, it would take as long as it takes to make a Facebook post, really. I mean, okay. you know, it's, 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 it's an organic thing. Um, so how, how much time are you willing to put into it? An organization are you willing to make? Um, do you want to make this in a community event where people are showing up on a Saturday at noon and you have a list of things you will accept and a list of things you won't and they can leave it there? Um, I would recommend not necessarily starting off at that level unless you already have, as I said, the back end figured out. What are you going to do with all the junk that's left right. behind? Because you are going to get things that are going to be a pro not a problem, but you're going to have to deal with. And that kind of rolls into the other question of like cost of facilities and things like that. And I was hoping to get like a back in the napkin. I'm looking at like, oh, as a as a part time thing, like maybe a maybe a month worth of setup, and then expending about a thousand to two thousand dollars to get the back end working. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's, it, it all depends on how far you want to take it. I mean, you could really do it on a shoestring budget. I mean, yeah, how much if Facebook is free. And if you can get someone to donate, particularly the county and your government will be a big help in this. And again, there could be public funds available to you. If you make the, the right pitch to the right person, you might find that there are county local funds that are specifically allocated to uh, clean up and recycling. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So do you have any uh, distinction between uh, much older hardware versus newer hardware? Because the, the newer stuff tends to be much more optimized. So, you know, cost of material, right? Absolutely. So the traces are a little smaller, they're thinner, and so on, and they're more precise. So do you get, have you seen this progression that the newer stuff is, is a little <laughs> bit more... Oh man, you just, yeah. you're singing my song. Um, I, I, unfortunately, we're in a, in a time crunch here, so I can't elaborate as far as I would like to because uh -huh. that, that's a whole other thing. So to quickly answer your question, absolutely, we do that. And um, moving forward into the future, what we're going to see is this is all going to change. We have gotten to the point now where we're making electronics using nothing but an epoxy blob. Yes, yes. You look at a circuit board, it's about this big, and in the middle of it, there's this black dot. That's it, yeah, right? Yeah. No, the days of chips and pins and wires and circuits and, and etching and all that's all done. It's all one, everything on a chip kind of deal. And we're seeing that, so absolutely. Um, and this is kind of, there's a double-edged sword to that, right? Because now there is a financial incentive to destroy the older stuff mm -hmm. because it's worth more, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and yeah. we actually price it out that way. It's, it's an unfortunate evil, but I am going to pay more scrap-wise for a Pentium motherboard, good old-fashioned ceramic Pentium CPU chip motherboard, yes. than I am for, say, a new Chinese uh, knockoff color, no-pin processor, uh, 775 socket motherboard in fact to the point where one the older pentium motherboard is worth five times as much as a more modern amd socket style motherboard okay. one dollar a pound versus five dollars a pound because that's how e-waste is purchased by the way it's a commodity that's measured in pounds and ounces per so, so i did notice that there's this reduction i, I was absolutely. curious if if it trickled down absolutely in fact uh, if you visit boardsort.com um you know have a seat <laughs> and take a look at my price list and you will see a distinct curve as we get into a more modern era that the amount of precious metals that are being used to manufacture these boards are minute. That's why you can go to Walmart and pay $200 for a PC today because there's nothing to them. It's, it's, it's fiber board and maybe a few um, BGA inst uh, chips and that's about it. 
And even if you uh, come across uh, uh, aluminum can from 10, 20 years ago, oh yeah, yeah, you you could you could feel you can that feel. Just, yeah. just, remember the old pull tab uh -huh. where you used to yeah. you cut yourself? Yeah. yeah, that that saved millions and millions and millions of dollars just because of the amount of material that was saved just in that. And by the way, that was that was invented in our hometown. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's an actual statistic. It's just little changes like that. And so modernization certainly saves saves in the manufacturing for sure. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question too, by the way. Hello, uh, Alex Kummer with Wisconsin Computer Club. We do a, uh, we actually have a sub-project where we rescue um, CRT monitors, so that's one of our side projects. In the effort to build something like what you've described, a, uh, an LLC or a business kind of thing that would then go and buy from recyclers, would you say that it would be better to form an actual business or better go with a non-profit angle? Um, for us, it wouldn't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wouldn't really matter because, again, I'm, we're not really going to ask those questions. Okay. You know, we just want to know so that, the, you know, again, the presentation that, is more important than the... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I just want to know that you're not just some guy that's going to waste my time, that if you've taken, if you've taken the time to put together an LLC or a nonprofit or any of that stuff, I mean, I, I think it's, there's a, a good chance that you could probably be taken seriously. And, and again, none of this is in concrete. There are no rules, oh. laws, regulations saying any of this even matters. But as a professional that does this every day, those are the things that matter to me and when I'm needing to make a decision on the fly as to whether I'm going to work with this guy or not, whether I'm going to tell him to hit the road because I don't have time, or if I'm going to take his business card and say, you know what, next time I have one of those, I'm going to give that guy a call and maybe it might work out. And so, yeah, it doesn't really matter what you are. As, as long as you give me a professional and uh, interesting presentation, I, I would consider it. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Chris, thanks very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the show. <laughs>